So Margie, it's so great to have you on the show and good to talk to another person from Minneapolis, uh, my hometown, your hometown. Uh, I know that we had to start having this conversation sooner or later, because if we didn't, we would just talk about places that we've been and restaurants we need to go to. So lots to share, lots to share uh, kindred spirit here. So uh, I, I know, you know, this, but I just want to introduce this topic. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, and it bears out in a book that I once read called Teams at the Top by a guy named John Kotzenbach, who was a Harvard professor and did a lot of research on teamwork. And he had another great book, for those of you who are interested in learning more about team structure, called The Wisdom of Teams, which I use quite a lot as kind of a Bible for the structure and the development of good teams. And he had this really new book and, and, and groundbreaking book that had to do with this other type of team, which is the senior team, the executive team, the teams at the top. And he made this really interesting, uh, and I think absolutely accurate point, which is that teams at the top are the hardest to develop, but can be the most impactful. And the reason why they're the hardest to develop, according to him and his research, is because they have been the individuals at the top, reinforced and praised and honed in on the skill of leadership versus team membership versus collaborating. So getting all these type A people in the room to get them to communicate and to collaborate and to work together as a team is hard because they haven't been doing that for a long time. They've been leading departments for 10, 15 years, what have you. So that's why he had this wonderful point, which was very impactful if you can get this going because it can cascade out to the entire organization. But to get the top team to work together is really tough. So what's your thoughts? What are your tips? Love to have you open up your brain and share with us why and how we can create really high performing senior level teams. So glad that you brought that up, Dean. And let's just start there. Number one, agree with everything Kotzenbach says. And when people are wondering what is, what do we know about leadership and what do we know about teams, Kotzenbach's work, which also was based on Shunk, a lot of this information has been out there 40 years. There's yeah. a gap. There's a gap between knowing and doing. And actually there's even a gap between no, just with knowing in general. And so my mission in life is we don't develop leaders and we don't develop teams. And we say we do. Or in the last 10 years, we've maybe even gone away from that. People seem to be comfortable not talking about that. But we will insist on hiring a lawyer who has gone to law school and passed the bar and maybe even has experience in our field. Or the HVAC person has all the certifications that we need. It's not our golfing buddy. It's not someone who knows a little bit and grew up in a plumbing family. And so that senior team, that, that quality of having gotten there in a certain way really is replicated throughout the company. So when we're not developing leaders the way we would develop if we thought it was the highest rate of return on investment in the entire company, nothing even comes close. Nothing you're doing as an organization, bar zero, are there any investments that you're making that will pay off like that will happen with your leaders? Because your leaders are the web, they're the network of all those other people. and. And when we at the top, they got there and they're used to being individual contributors and getting a lot of pats on the back and getting compensation for being a, a maverick, going off in their own direction, coming from another company where they were published over and over again. And it wasn't the team that was talking, it was just them. Yep, they do get in that habit, but so does the supervisor. So does the very first manager because that, that manager for the first time did not learn leadership yet. And every one of their leaders, it, that is the only way that they are learning leadership is from their leaders. It's a, mm. it's a make it up as you go along. It's an on the job training. Well, each of those leadership levels have the same thing. And the problem that we have in organizations is we're not talking about it openly. It's the worst kept secret on the planet. So people, so people go. don't even want to tell themselves that they don't know how to lead or they're not sure what to do. They just want to keep going with, well, it's working for me so far. Let's keep going with this. So the it, the antecedent of it is leadership development. What are you, what is it that so we're not talking about? So it's first of all, recognizing that, that leadership is a whole package of behaviors and skills and habits. Okay. 
So in a leadership's day, in a leader's day, those are habits all day long. And when we don't change our habits, things don't change. But Shunk, 40 years ago, laid out, and Katzenbach, these pioneers laid out the short list of things that we need to do to be an effective leader and to grow effective teams. Right. And all the other books, all the other podcasts, TED Talks, they're based on some of those same principles. So when you don't build those foundational processes and you don't talk openly at work about behavior and the humanness of the people coming in the door, including yourself, the humanness in each leader, then you're missing it. And Gino Wickman in Traction says, as mm. goes the leadership team, so yes. goes the company. So if you've heard that you, it's impossible to change culture, well, it just is what it is. It's hubris. It's stuck. Culture takes on a life of its own. Actually, no. Culture is the outcome of how you're leading, your decisions, you're the things that you say, the things that you don't say, the things that you re reinforce. And when you have a group, I once had a, at one of the Fortune 500 publicly traded companies that you would know well, I was there and they described their top team as savants. Each mm. of them was a savant in his or her field. And that was a compliment. And I remember actually working there for a while thinking, not a compliment. Even at the top of a very large company, if they're not aligned, if they can't speak for each other, do their elevator pitch of what the CEO and the board of directors are going after this year, what is the vision and how are we making it happen and how are we maintaining that? How are we prioritizing? If they can't do that for each other, then they're just going back and running their own companies is basically what they're doing. Right. And they are not they are not an aligned group. When you're not an aligned group, guess what? Alignment is missing all over the organization. But let's go smaller. Let's say it's an organization of 1,500 people. That team at the top is setting the tone for virtually everything you're doing every single day. Right. And if you have not... Maybe you're lucky. Maybe you have a couple of people who were um, had mentors or had development opportunities where they are leaders who understand. And I'll give you what my short list is of what it means to lead well. Maybe you're lucky and you have that and it's starting to, it's infectious. It, it grows and it just becomes a part of the environment, the atmosphere, the culture. But when you don't have that, then you have what so many organizations have today. And I'll use just one example that most people can relate to. Your meetings are terrible. And why are we putting up with that? I think it's because th they don't realize the root causes. So if I tell you, I can come in right now and help you fix your meetings. And you'll say, well, Margie, we've done all that. We, A, I know all that. Kind of like, why are you talking down to me? I know all that. Do you? A, knowledge gap. But then even if you know it and you can say, actually, we tried that and it didn't work. So the fundamentals for how to have an effective meeting have not changed. It doesn't matter if you're in person or remote. It doesn't matter what type of industry you're in. But when you're not making that happen, it's because of those other things. You've got politics going on. You've got FOMO going on, fear of missing out. I just did the math on a meeting I was in with a client um, during the pandemic, $5,000 for one hour meetings weekly, 40 people and only two of them did any talking. Do that so math. So yeah, there's some funny, the serendipity of this. I was just talking to somebody before we had this call and we've got this not really well uh, designed yet, but it's called the meeting productivity calculator. Mm -hmm. And our whole point of view, based on some research that we found by a guy named Vogelberg out of South Carolina, is that, of course, all of the leadership and team dynamics get played out a lot of the times, not always, yeah. in the meeting, right? Absolutely. If you want to find out about the culture of a company or yep. of a family, go sit and have dinner with them. If you want to find out about the culture of a company, go sit and watch some meetings. And so your point is that if, if we don't measure it, we don't change it. And so yep. we, I think meeting, meetings are one of the most hidden and expensive costs of any company. So expensive. And then and and, if you were to, if you were to break it down an hourly though, yep, and figure out yep, what you're talking 5%. about and then you rate it, it more, more than 50% of the value of meetings is basically wasted. And then calculate the unmet calculate what you didn't get out right. of it. So the oh, missing yeah. cause. Right. And, and, it's huge. and what, and what that means is that's your canary in the coal mine. Yes. If your meetings are terrible. And I know they are most people, it, they're not even trying to hide it. They, they're just so lost. They don't know what to do. They actually say, Oh, organizations are so complex today. It, it's what we've got. There's nothing we can do. Yeah. There's everything you can do, but it's your canary in your coal mine. When you're not solving that problem, you have all your other issues. You have silos. You have gossip. 
So there you are, a CEO or an executive director, and you have a leadership team, and you feel like you're herding cats or it's preschool. You've got these people that are being written out about in Forbes, and they're leading podcasts, and they're writing articles, and they're whining, and they're complaining, and they're coming to you to solve their problems. And you thought, wow, we hired you because you're good in your field, and we expected you to lead, leader in every chair. And But what they're missing is the fundamental things to do. That person is not getting up in the morning saying, today, I'm going to be a mediocre leader again. It's not like that. There's so many more things you want to get ahead of. You want to slow down. You want to invest in this. Those fires you're fighting, they're always the same. Why is that? Because you're not getting ahead of them. Those problems right. that keep coming up over and over, over again, that's because you're not investing in the uh, what's underneath. And that top team is not coalescing. They are, they can't speak for each other. They're not cohesive. And when you're not cohesive, I'm not talking about doing a robes course or grabbing a guitar and singing in a circle. I'm talking about, do each of you tell the same story for what the three to five goals are this year? Not the 27 goals, the three to five. And if you can't do that, how are your teams supposed to do that? And if there are more than three to five, how are your teams supposed to keep up? So those three to five, can you each recite those same things in the same way? And then do you each know your own part in that and your team's part? And can you can you appreciate that? Can you recite that for each other in yourselves? And then do you turn around and go to your team and recite the same three to five goals and say what our team's part is in, in that? And then for each person on your team, do they know their part. I once worked with a, a client who for one year had had a transformation up and running for changing their whole business model and it wasn't gaining any traction. I come to work with a four person leadership team, not a 20 or a 10 or an eight, a four person leadership team who worked physically side by side for an entire year. And when we did the very first exercise to really clarify, are you telling the same story? You work on the same things. They All their boats were going in the same direction. They actually got teary eyed. They got a little frustrated. They couldn't believe that people that they'd spent that much time together, that inside their heads, their view of something was not checked. The assumptions weren't checked and they weren't clear with each other. So their teams were off rowing in different directions and the morale was low. Okay, Fix let's the say, clarity, let's... yeah. Let's take a pause for a second. Oof. Yep. Ah, there's a lot you just said. So let me repeat some of the things you said yeah. uh, in terms of the, the senior team. One, we really said this over and over again that they set the tone for the rest of the organization. You talked about improving the meeting structure in the practice of it and make it much more valuable. You talked about making sure that the senior team knows what the key three to five goals are and having the same story that they tell their teams and making sure that their teams align to that. Uh, all of that's really good. So let's let's get under under the sheets for a second. Why do senior teams or members of senior teams, since they seem to be the the, the start of a whole cascade, a whole domino effect, is this is this besides the fact that they have been reinforced over time to be leaders, not team players? What's the what's the the reason why we have such a hard time collaborating? Why do we struggle with this? Is this imposter syndrome? Is it is it turf wars? Is it is it hey we got succession planning coming up and ergo I got to start building my empire because you know I want to be the next you know what I mean or is it all of that or what else I mean why it do is we all of with that. This? And all of those are in this huge uh, ball of rubber bands that sort of got stuck together and it got added on and it got added on and got added on. What you want to do is cut through, pause, and choose the four or five things that you can focus on now. What you want is a leader who sees the beauty. So when you're playing pickleball or you're on the golf course, you're not talking about the dynamics that you and I are talking about today. We're not talking about clarity. We're not talking about alignment. Leaders need to over communicate. That's boring. That's hard that you kind of don't want to do that. We're not talking about that. Once a leader, let's say they bring me in, but they, they don't usually bring me in because we need clarity or alignment. They don't even know that. Or if they yeah. know that they don't want to talk about it. They're not an expert on that. That's not fun. That's not why you're paying me the big bucks. That's not why I left out of the company to come here so that we could talk about clarity and alignment. But, but if they bring me in and we fix their meetings or we do working genius, which is the most amazing thing that has come down the pike in the last several years, that's um, Lencioni um, and mm. their amazing assessment model. 
once they or come in, I come in just for clarity, which I did with a company in Ukraine, just for clarity. Once we get inside of there and they see, they might see for the first time that a company can be led differently. They have nothing to compare it to and they have no hope. It's, it sounds weird to say, but they don't have hope. They don't have a vision for how it can go because each of their experiences up to this point in their career has looked like the other way. Yeah. And to put yourself away from the pack to, to stick your head up above the, the ground, to, to make yourself uh, vulnerable, is, is there's just nothing natural. The brain won't have it. You know, a lot of what we're dealing with is the hardwiring of the brain. Yeah. We, we, when we're trying to make some big changes, we say, oh, people are so resistant or leaders just want their own da 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 Actually, it's their brain. Their brain are not having it because it's too hard. They're keeping us alive every minute, which is why we have to lead them. So when a leader, either their board of directors or their, um, their leader before them, or they're on the leadership team and they're lucky enough to have a leader who listens or who is open, when they find out about the success of other people and what it does for their outcomes, even if all you want to do is increase engagement across the company or retain talent in this really tight market, who's, who's staying in your company right now? The people that are willing to not have cameras on and go to meetings where there's 40 people and they never have to talk. Mm -hmm. Those are not the people you want to retain. But you need to, an excuse, you need a, a, a an example of something and start to get a little bit of success with it and start to feel like, oh, because they're not talking about behavior at work. You should be talking about behavior at work. How did we not, how did we get away from that? Fortunately, uh, people like you and Brene Brown and the pandemic, we now are much more amenable to talking about vulnerabilities and talking about the humanness. We should never use the phrase soft skills. There's nothing soft about being clear and aligned. Mm -hmm. This is where your, your services and your cl new, more clients and your dollars are. This is, you, you don't have a vision of it because it wasn't on your radar. Get a little bit of hope. Get a little bit of view of what it's like and you'll start to see the ROI. Even fixing meetings becomes a very intuitive process to say, oh my goodness, we're a different company once we fix our meetings. We want more of that. So it does this have to start with the top person? Like so when I, I when I I have a feeling about that. Like if you don't if it's called it the CEO, yeah. whomever, right? I mean, if, they, if they're not on board, if they're not leading the charge, if they're not leaning into this transformation that we're talking about here, I can't see that it would work. But what's your sense? It won't work for the entire company. But what I can tell you is when I, I had been, I have a long career of being fired. I get fired a lot. So I get, so which is why I finally had to be an entrepreneur because only I would fire me then. So <laughs> lots of firings, lots of layoffs. Do your own performance review. You're doing yeah. great. <laughs> oh, I'm doing great. I really am. Lots yeah. of, I'm just going to say out loud toxic, unhealthy environments that I kept finding myself in thinking, what are we doing? These are people yeah. you're dealing with. So then I went back and did got my doctorate in organization development and my dissertation was on teams. And what I found is you can be anywhere in the company and develop a high performing team and be a leader and develop your leadership yeah. and have that go okay for 12 to 18 months on average. At some point in that process, the data was really clear. You're going to leave. Your team's going to change. You're right. going to need the higher budget, the, the bigger budget. You're going to need leadership around you, but you can be in a bubble and you can be effective for about 12 to 18 months. Because the reason that's important to say is don't wait. Don't if you're if you're hearing me right now and you're not the CEO, you're thinking there is nothing I can do. I'm just going to either sit back or I'm going to go somewhere else there. You have options to fix your meetings today, to be more clear and over communicate today, to do working genius and find out how to uh, schedule services and make sure it all uh, happens on time and the way you want it. You can do that today. And then you want to have the opportunity for the CEO and the top of the executive director and the top team um, to make this happen. You know, I came up at a time where we talked about managing up. That was a thing. It was the the titles of books, whatever. Where, whoever thought that was a good idea. Are we really going to put on the backs of a leader, a manager, a supervisor, or whatever to manage up? No, CEOs, as far as my voice is right now, it's on you. And I promise you, you like your life so much better. When they say it's lonely at the top, when they talk about imposter syndrome, those are all 
outside ways of describing not knowing what to do as a leader, not having an aligned team, not hitting it out of the park and certain things. You don't feel good experimenting because you're not able to move fast. You keep having the same problems. That's when it's lonely. That's when you have burnout. Burnout doesn't happen when everything is feeling engaging and productive. Burnout happens when it's the definition of insanity, the same thing over and over, the same results. So as a CEO, if you want a better life, look at behavior, look at the what we've known for 40 plus years on how to do this. You can do it. Now, I will say some people will have to come off the bus. Um, but yeah, absolutely. They don't want to participate. They don't want to play at that level. It's not the game they want to be into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and when I work with clients, I'm very upfront and it, I build it right into the contract. I can't do this for you. You, I can't do it in absence. You can't outsource this to HR. It's really about you and I will facilitate and shepherd and observe. I'll come and watch your meetings and we'll start to talk openly. We'll start to have real conversations. You should be having real conversations. Another way that a, a, a CEO or a senior leader is not liking their day is they're not having real conversations. That's not fun for anybody. We don't want that at home. We don't want it when we volunteer. We don't want it with our friends. We don't want to have unreal conversations. We want work to feel that way, that exhilarating piece, which is we're having real conversations. Yeah, it's like everybody, I was just coming from a conference recently and then the, somebody said, yeah, every company wants to improve communication just so long there's no feelings involved. <laughs> I thought, absolutely very bright and well said. Um, but to your point, you know, we don't speak uh, frankly with people. And, and that's why I've always thought that leadership and companies as a whole has the ability for social change at a scale and impact that is larger than politics, healthcare, education, you are so right. and you, religion. It's everything. It's, it's everything. all of it. And if people are going to call me crazy for saying that. Yeah. But when you think about how much time do we spend at our jobs and, and that there's so much around measurement and so forth. And so leaders, in my perspective, is that we have to balance the fact that your job is not just about the getting the stuff done. As somebody said to me today, it's about knowing what to do and knowing how to do it. That's that's part of leadership for sure. And do the math. Each person in that organization impacts what you just described, transcending politics, the world, the, the sociology of the world. Each person in your company represents, you know, impacts about 10 to 15 people out the outside world. of the organization. So anything, so anything you do. Great point really does make the world a better place. It sounds kind of sappy and I feel like I've come into this at the right time because I grew up wanting everybody to be happy. Well, and then I became an adult and I thought, well, where does everybody go? They go to work. So I want people to be happy at work. And then I realized, then I took that down and said, that's not what we're supposed to do. I was trained to say, don't use the word happy at work. Lencioni with his working genius, not only is it productivity you get as a result of it, it's joy at work. He just says that out loud. And yeah. each of those people want that. They're, they have feelings, whether you're talking about them or not, everybody has it, you have it. The leader has it, even if they don't want to know that. All of that is made better when work is better. And then you've got Vivek Murthy, who is our current uh, Surgeon General. And I keep talking about this on this podcast as he wrote a book. It's called, I think it's Togetherness. And he's basically saying that his big stake in the ground regarding health initiatives and improvement is not obesity, uh, not cancer, not heart disease, it's loneliness and isolation. Yes. And he's making yes. the point that if that if we are at a pandemic level relative to these two conditions and you yes. research, research, research. So of course, the currency for so many companies these days is going to be happiness. It's going to be engagement. It's going to be joy because we're not getting it anywhere. We got to find some place to get it, right? And and companies have this wonderful, challenging but wonderful opportunity to provide that. And of course, it's a two way street. You know, it's not just we provide it for you. Now it's going to change everything. You got to you got to step up. But I do come back to this idea that we can really and I. That's why I do this. We make yeah. huge changes in the world because we are not only measurably making something happen for our customers, for our clients, for our employees, but we're evolving the human spirit. We're evolving yeah. the humankind in the process of doing this. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know how many times I've had a coaching conversation that says, yeah, you, you're a surgeon at Mayo. Okay, great. You're a surgeon. You're, you're, you're an engineer at Honeywell, right? Great. That's the game you're playing. But the real game is your own evolution as a human being and then how you mm -hmm. translate that and affect other people's evolution. And when you start getting that, you realize, OK, uh, it's going to be a bumpy ride. But but the impact is is tremendous. 
And if we wanted to redefine the, the uh, servant leadership, every leader is serving the world either well yes. or not as well. Yes. And some of this is hardwired. Our brains are naturally, it's a lot safer in packs. We are hardwired to connect because that is safer. But then we know all this other stuff that's going on that you can't see, taste, or smell. It just, it just uh, thrives on connections. We thrive on sharing ideas. We thrive on me bringing to the table the, the personality skills that or aspects that I have and then mixing them up with yours, Dean. It's exhilarating to be different and to bring come together and have a bigger, it's a, a bigger equation that you know the 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 whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. Do that math around all around the company. And if you have no other good reason, you know, ROI aside, as a leader, you're serving the world. So each time really? you hear yourself as a leader, each time you hear yourself say you wish something was different in the world or you wish something was different in your company, I promise you anything you do with leadership and group dynamics and behaviors and feelings and uh, being articulate, being clear and aligned, all of that does that thing that you wish would change. Yeah, and everything's a mirror, I think, back and forth to each other. You, know, you talk about this transformative power of leadership inside of a company and how we can transform the world outside of the company. We were just talking about, you know, how do we increase the experience of our customers, right? So there's a lot of like research on that and surveys and all that. Customer experience is really important. But what's missing is the people who are delivering that customer service. What's the customer service like inside the company? That's right. So, That's so right. you you want to really you really want to make an impact, do both. Do internal customer service, which is leadership, team building, developing a strong culture of trust, psychological safety, throw, throw in all sorts of stuff. That then becomes something that easily can be authentically given to our customers that when we talk to them on the phone or go meet with them in shops or right. what have you. And, and once you start to see those, those connections, now you've got power, now you've got alignment, now you've got authentic uh, progress Well, in the old ways are, I once had a, a, a VP and a professor say to me out loud, the most important stakeholder is your shareholder. And I remember thinking, really? Oh, so I tried to take that in. I'm a student, I'm gonna learn, I'm a sponge. Mm. No. Yeah. Your most important stakeholder is your employee. Mm -hmm. They're the ones making it happen. All that right. other stuff will go better it's, it's, they're the vehicle. They're not just a vehicle, they're a person, but they are the way you set yourself up to engage with the world. They are the right. way that you are going to create a product or sell a service or provide a service. You are going to do that. You're right. not doing it alone. You chose yeah. to not do it alone. You grew it. The most important person in the mix is the employee for customer experience, for sales, for uh, how you uh, uh, work in the market. And all right. of that is available to you. The, I think that transformation with a big T, I think people get overwhelmed. Oh, Margie, I hear you talking. Dean, I hear you talking. It sounds like a lot. It's, I, I'm, I'm a, our culture is firm. There's nothing we can do. You don't understand. My, my industry is special or my company is special. Uh -huh. Yep, they're all special. Really, I would just say start somewhere. Don't take it all on. Right. The transformation with a lowercase t. Start somewhere the way you would at home. If your whole household was falling apart, you would do something. You wouldn't just move. You wouldn't go across the street and wait it out. You would start somewhere. Start somewhere. And it starts to build on itself. And then you start to get organized. I'm a structure person. I'm a governance person. I'm a big picture person. You'll start to formulate the new as you're getting your um, bearings and understanding, oh, wait, I thought I had to do 27 things. No, do these five and let's get those right. And open yourself up to people attending your meetings and giving you feedback. Open yourself up to people being a part of your performance management and telling you what they hear. Learn, do you know, close the knowledge gap and then close the gap between knowing and doing and you'll start to get traction. And I don't know if flywheel is the right metaphor, but mm. it does start to really build like a snowball here in Minneapolis. It starts to build <laughs> and go much farther, much faster once you get started somewhere. Yeah, because we think we're saying the same thing, but it starts with the individual. You know, we talked a lot about organizations and creating great meetings and being able to get senior team members on the same page and cascade that to the organization. Oh, that's true. But, you know, somebody who's listening to this and say, well, I'm not a CEO. I'm not on the ELT. I'm not on the SLT. I don't, I don't play in that world. That's okay. Do your own transformation. 
Start yes. with your own self-awareness. Spend some time to be able to reflect on how last week went, how today went. But what lessons can you learn, whether they were painful lessons or positive lessons? How, what can you do? Constantly use yourself as a laboratory for your own growth and development. Because yeah. if everybody did that, just think how what, what kind of changes we would have. But so yeah, you're not ask without- your leader. What are the goals? What are the three to five goals this year? And if there are 20, you can't change it. To just listen and take it in. But then what's my part? And how am I doing? The one, another piece we haven't talked about is monitoring. So a leader, uh, individuals on their team, they should know every week how the leader thinks they're doing. They, they should always know my leader has given me what I need to do my work and I know how they think. We shouldn't have to wait till quarterly, semi-annually or annually. And also they paid a lot for those computer systems. Part of the reason they keep them is because they paid a lot of money. So they're, they're not even using them because they're the right choice. The choice is leader, if you have five people reporting to you, just make sure they know how, what you, how you think they're doing every single week. Yeah, yeah. Informal and dialogue. <clears throat> that you'll start to grow real conversations just by having those conversations. So I think that's a great, uh, I mean, there's so much we could talk about, uh, about organizational development. And of course, we'd have to start talking about more great Minneapolis restaurants, but that, that's a great send off, I think, to this conversation is as if you're listening to this, get clear about um, what the goals are within your organization, yes. align to that, communicate that, and then continue to use yourself as a uh, a, a, a laboratory of your own development, you know, continue to, to develop your self-awareness. So Margie, how can people follow you? Tell us about your, your business or how yeah. people can connect to you. Are there any sort of uh, yep. special so projects you're team, working on? Yep. Yeah. Top team accelerator. And that is an approach to focus on just the, the, the key short list of where you start and how you fix things right away. And so you can go to top team accelerator, all one word, top team accelerator.com. And there's an okay. assessment there. You just point and click. It's a statement about where you're at in this area and where you're at in that area. And that really tells you the list of 15 ways to think about the most important things to uh, make sure you address right now. And then it immediately gives you feedback on what to do where you're at based on that score. And then I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you, Margie, O-L-E-S-O-N, and a lot of free resources out there. Olson Consulting is my website. You can get there from TalkTeamAccelerator.com. Lots of ways to tell the story and articles about what you can do. Fix your meetings today. You'll love your life when you fix your meetings today. That's so true, because if you can get that right, man, a lot of other things will fall into place. As we said before, the, the whole culture of an organization can be seen and experienced for better or for worse at that weekly meeting. And it's so <laughs> funny good. to hear people talk about it as if there's literally nothing they can do and it's all happening to them. It's a right. meeting, change it. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, Margie, it's been a lot of fun talking to you. Um, have a great time in Minneapolis. Uh, nice hope team. you get up to the lake, as they say. Absolutely. Go go yeah. up there and say hi to Oli and Babe the Blue Ox. Yeah. Uh, and let, some... let's connect when you're in town, that would be great. I definitely will. <laughs> okay.